there's a certain part of the population that felt that feels, I think like EP is, um, only for the elite. Right. And I know people that roll EP for people that are not elite. They mm -hmm. just want protection for whatever their particular reason is. I um, mean, it could be because they have an ex spouse that's a fucking nutball or they have a, um, they have a family dispute that, that stuff's going on or they have a business. They're just, you know, that leaves them at risk that they're trying to stay out of. So maybe we could kind of go down that path of, you know, e you know, the type of clients you might be working with, but like who else, who else, you know, maybe contracts or employees executive protection because executive protection sort of implies it's big corporate CEOs, diplomats, things like that. Yeah. And there are a lot of people in this country right now that are really bitter about those types of people. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, that's, but that's not all they do. It's just, it's just, I think it just has that connotation. Yeah. So. I, I totally 100% agree with that. Okay. And I think a vast majority of what we're doing right now is, yeah, we touch the C-suite a lot, but mm -hmm. obviously a vast majority of that, like I said, is they're just normal everyday folks that might be working for, you know, a company that makes political decisions and, you know, they happen to be a decision maker and they've wound up in a situation where it's politicized and they're a target, you know, they're a target. So they're, you know, now they're having EP um, and it looks different for everyone. EP is not always a bodyguard in a suit with an earpiece following you around everywhere you go. Right. It's, it's very different nowadays. And that's one thing that we're seeing is the landscape shifted a lot in the past just even the past two years is vastly different. So people aren't working from an office anymore. So what does that look like? You know, where does EP and transcend outside office walls nowadays? It's not just in your office anymore. And it's not just for the C-suite. And that's one thing that we're, we're seeing a vast, a vast difference in. And also I think it's going to be somewhat of the future of security, especially EP is people want to feel safe in their homes because people are working remotely now. We're actually given all these workouts at the academy now and we're doing them. It makes about half a million dollars a month. An extra 20 grand for canine? Perfect. He's like, keep it up, girl. <laughs> I see a bunch of fucked up shit throughout the job that a normal individual should not see. Iron side exclusive. I love, it. I love it. Yeah, you get it. That's why I can't spell. <laughs> but uh, we're right now. <laughs> when he was smacking me in the back of the head with a knife. Within a year and a half, I was six in the world. Wow. Welcome back to the Iron Sights Podcast After Dark. I am here with uh, Blake Kreider, who is basically a director with an executive protection agency called Crisis 24. Blake, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Appreciate being here. Glad to be here. I'm stoked to have you here, especially since you're not local. Uh, I happened to catch you and we were, we were able to connect, but happened to catch you sort of on an in-between. So you're taking time out of a very busy, hectic uh, itinerary that, you know, I'm sure you're working hour to hour, minute to minute, and you took time out of your day. So thanks again, dude. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Uh, executive protection. It's at one of the fastest growing industries in the world right now. And there's so much that goes into that. And I have friends that I've trained with and worked with and worked and, and uh, been around uh, quite a bit in these last couple of years. And I find the whole industry extraordinarily fascinating. And I find in that what I've found with that is there's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of like, this is just some John Wick kind of shit, you know, kind of thing and all of that. And so I'm hoping today we can kind of talk through what it's like um, from your perspective in the EP world. Um, just talk a little bit about that, but then also maybe handle some of those things, maybe some of the things you're hearing and seeing out there. But I think the unique perspective you're certainly bringing to this is not only are you a boots on the ground guy, but you're now working at more of an executive level, which allows you to get your hands and in, in fingers into a lot of other things and exposures you to a ton of stuff, which uh, we might not necessarily know or hear about it. So, and recognizing some of this stuff could be really sensitive. We'll try and tread, tread uh, carefully around it, but I would love to hear your story and your background and kind of how, how you got into this and where you are now. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. I really appreciate it. It's just, it's awesome to be here and just chat with you. So thank you for that. Um, so I think for many people is what you get into a profession, you somehow wondered, how did I end up here? And I don't think that's any different from an EP profession. I didn't grow up thinking I was going to be, you know, a bodyguard for people. So I, I think, uh, going through college, uh, I was a college athlete, got a chance to play football at Northern Michigan there. And, um, okay. Love, love playing football. What'd you play? What position? I, I played tight end. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yep. So it was good. So kind of when that came to an end, I was looking for another challenge, something that was unique, 
um, having done a few ride alongs with police officers um, locally and even in different states, I knew that it probably wasn't going to be a good fit for what I was looking for. I think I was looking for something that was um, kind of gave me a chance to travel a little bit, um, maybe use some interpersonal skills in a different way. Um, mad respect for PD, but I just knew that that probably wasn't going to fit my personal personality well. Got it. So looking for that, I actually ended up, um, you know, got a criminal justice degree, started working for General Motors down in Detroit, um, very busy area, um, doing asset protection stuff for them. Um, that's basically just, you know, you're moving around doing a bunch of different things for them. So you're protecting floors, you're on the, you know, executive floors, you're doing, it's kind of like your entry level into security, I guess I would say. Okay. I'd already done some balancing stuff and you know, that the stuff to pay the bills okay. in college, right? So that's, uh, that's kind of where I started. But beyond that, um, I was there and I had a buddy, he was working with me. Um, and he's like, Blake, I want to show you something. I think this is something you'll be interested in. So he kind of let me peek behind the curtain of EP. They had a, you know, executive protection team for the C-suite of General Motors, right? Um, so one day he took me up, these guys are doing bug sweeps of the office. They have a canine in there. I'm like, what is this? Yeah, this is some like James Bond shit. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, this is super cool. I'm like, what are these guys? He's like, this is like, this is what a bodyguard looks like. It's not like you think it is. He's like, you know, and a lot of these guys were a retired PD. Um, you know, they were, they were in this, you know, after a 20 year career or something. So, you know, being that kind of the young gung ho guy I was, I said, Hey, can I join this team? I want to do that. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of the catch 22 after college, right? Is um, you have to get gain experience, but you can't gain experience. So you get you, the yeah. experience. Yeah. yeah. So it's that catch 22, especially when it comes to bodyguarding, right? It's like, you want to be a bodyguard. That's fantastic, but you have no experience, sir. So, right. um, but you know, kind of also being the guy I am, I, I don't take no for an answer. And I don't think that, you know, when you get told no in life, it just, sometimes it just means not right now, or maybe you do need to gain that experience. So um, I had kind of researched some companies having found that that was a very cool thing, something that I was interested in. It looked like a unique skill set. Um, it took a lot of dedication, a lot of hard work. And I was like, it was kind of, it's a, you know, it's a niche market. Like there's not a lot of EP guys floating around out there, at least not that I knew of at that time. Right. It was so I thought that to be something pretty cool after playing football. I was like, I want something that's going to be, you know, different, like unique, keep me, keep me wanting more, keep me hungry. Um, so Having done that, I researched some companies um, and came across one called Gavin De Becker. Um, so okay. World renowned EP big company. One. Huge big one. one, right? So um, I, I I just took a leap. I, you know, I applied for them. You go through a physical readiness uh, test. So that basically just says that, hey, you're physically fit. Um, you could pass our standards. Um, hopefully, you know, they have different sets of standards there. And then from there, you jump into specialized training. Um, so you go to an academy and um, I was lucky enough to get invited to an academy. I think there was a thousand applicants. They boiled it down to 19 at the time. And when I graduated, I graduated with seven people overall. Oh shit. Okay. This, so it's pretty, this is, um, this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, no. So let's time out for a second. Let's go back to the physical piece. Sure. So you're coming off being a college athlete, right? Uh, playing, I don't know, Northern North Michigan's D1. Division two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. So th that's neither here nor there, but the bottom line is you're being a competitive athlete, right? Mm -hmm. You come out. So, um, I heard you say you're doing a little bouncing. So you're probably a little bit of one of the bigger dudes, more fit dudes. What was the physical, you know, preparation for that test really like? I think for me, it well, I guess for me, it wasn't too much outside of what I was already doing okay. at that moment. I was actually just getting done training to be in the, I thought I was going to go play in the NFL. I had a chance. I had an okay. agent. Um, I had got a chance to do tryouts, um, um, had signed release letters for the Dolphins, the Lions, the Rams. It was the whole nine, the year of the lockout um, back in 2010. Oh, damn. Um, so that was when I had got a chance said, hey, we're going to bring you into some mini camps. And then the next call I got was mini camps are no longer right. available. We, we can't take a chance on you being a small time player. So I was like, that was the pivot for me of like, man, I need a my plan B just became my plan. A. I got to use my degree, which is always a great thing to have as a, you know, a college right. athlete, right. You know, that's so, where you go. You get your papers, man, you get your papers. So, um, I think that was something that I dove into, but yeah, the physical piece for me, I was, I was kind of in like, you know, combine shape at that, that point. So They're I was kill, probably killing it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. to a degree, right. I think the thing that I really lacked though, kind of fast forwarding a little bit was jumping to the Academy was, you know, I didn't have a military background. A lot of 95% of guys that get into EP do, or maybe like I said, they're prior police. So they have that, that weapons training or that deaf tech hand to hand mm -hmm. combat training. But I think also the thing that set me apart was I was kind of a sponge. I was just humble enough to just be like, I don't know how to do that. Important. I need like, you know, whether, 
that was firearms, def tech, um, water survival, you know, anything that was, you know, medical. I was like, Hey, I don't know how to do that, but I'm definitely willing to learn. Yeah, put me in coach hundred percent. Yeah. So that was kind of my mentality going in. And I think that that boded well for me. I was, you know, I graduated from this Academy and I was placed with, you know, um, a celebrity in the LA area. And seven guys, seven people came out of this. Thing. Seven people came okay. out of, yeah. So, right. so I was super happy. You know, I, I moved from Michigan at that point. Um, me and my now my wife, we moved um, from Ferndale all, all the way to Los Angeles. Uh, how about how's the culture shock? With hey, that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Tell, talk about it. Man. Yeah. Like, talk about moving into LA for the first time. Working for sure. For, like uh, some celebrity, I think this is what you said. Yeah. What's that like? Yeah, it was just, it's super interesting to just kind of get thrust into that, that atmosphere and that world. Um, you know, I was 23 when I went through the Academy 24 by the time I graduated. So I was, you know, green as can be, um, I think hungry, uh, you know, like I said, I was willing and able to learn. Um, I had some really great mentors in the industry that just, you know, took me under the wing and that they were willing to take a chance on me. And like, I like kind of reverted back to talking about working at GM was like, maybe someone there wasn't willing to take the chance on me. And I totally get that you're playing, you're not playing just a game. You're, this is a game of people's lives, right? This is serious business. You're guarding people and their families and it's, it's serious. But, um, um, you know, Gavin De Becker was a huge blessing for me. That company showed me everything I needed to know, you know, to at least, you know, get my boots on the ground. And then from there I had great mentors on the job showing me like, Hey, this is what you should and shouldn't do. This is how you should handle yourself. And I'm just, I'm thankful for a company like that. that just oozes professionalism. Yeah, man. I hear all the time, you know, like you go through these academies, you go through these learning processes and inevitably the ones that are the most successful that I talk to that that's in business, you know, athletics, you know, what EP, whatever it happens to be, there were more than one person in that line or in that, that journey that put their arm around a person and said, Hey, listen, I know everything you've been taught. I've been there. I've done this. And uh, now I'm going to show you how this shit really works. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, here's all the standard protocols. Here's all the, here's all the standard, standard processes. But I'm going to teach you and I'm going to show you how to watch out for the stuff that where you're going to get punched in the side of the head because right. you didn't know. Like, and there just there isn't a way to teach you that, right. you know, outside of being on the job. I think it's so important, especially for a person that's very coachable. Um and uh, has that hunger and that drive to continue to be successful because it's those same people, again, the most successful ones, much, much like yourself, that want to give back then, right? Mm -hmm. Once they, and we'll talk, I think, a little bit about that, but you, you're sort of talking about like the mindset piece, which we can dig into a little bit here because I'm curious about that. We'll do that in a minute. But um, yeah, just the, the kind of wanting to settle in and, and learn everything, but at the same time, wanting to accelerate probably beyond your skill set at sure. the, at, at the time. So walking into, uh, so again, sort of like the, the busy hustle bustle of like the LA scene and, and, and things, what was it, if anything that caught you off guard first, was there anything that was like the, what was the biggest surprise when you got there? I think for me, it's just, um, coming from the Midwest, just that fast paced lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, you see these people and they're successful for a reason, but you don't just realize like they're so stringent with their schedule and their time and they're just so efficient. And in turn, that means you have to be even more efficient with your time and how you're providing a service to these people. And I think that you see um, coming from the Midwest, coming to LA, you get to really see the business side of LA. You get to see the business side of Hollywood and what that's like. And the good, bad, and ugly. The good, bad, and the ugly. Like you get to you get to see what that's like, and you get to see how how these people operate. You know, to get to where they're at, and to also most importantly to maintain where they're at. You know, they're always grinding, always hustling. So I think that really taught me when I was 24. I was like, dude, it's time to hustle. Like you, you thought you were hustling. You don't know what hustle looks like. So that was like that was a swift kick in my ass, just yeah. of like. No, man, like this is hustling. Like, so next level. Yeah. So like that was even more of a humbling process, not in the sense of like, oh, I'm so humble, like in the sense of like, man, I got, I got a long ways to go. Like right. these guys that are teaching me are that much better than me. Um, you know, these, these people that are doing it, it's like, it gave me something to shoot for. Um, not necessarily in the terms of how they were living their life, but in the terms of how I was living mine, I knew there was like something had to change. Like you can't do the same, um, the same routines and expect you to get different results. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that's very important to remember is like, okay, I was 24. So I was trying to still do 24 year old things, but run at a different level, an elevated level, an elevated platform, doing elevated things. And like that didn't jive. And like, I could, 
you know, you get yourself into a mix of like, this is not good. This is not a recipe for success. So switching that mindset of being like, all right, like you have to mature quickly. And I think that's probably something that, you know, high inside, I wish I would have been a little more mature in the beginning in terms of like my overall thought process with things or, but I, I don't think you, you learn by doing you just. Yeah. That's interesting. Like what? So not mature enough. And I, again, like wisdom, knowledge comes with experience. Wisdom comes with the knowledge and the ability to know when to apply or not apply mm -hmm. certain things. May, can you give us an example of, you know, some of those things that you were maybe struggling with? Yeah, uh, for sure. So I think for me, it was just, I think when you're young, you don't manage your time well. Like, okay. um, so I think that was probably something that um, I didn't do very well. And also, I don't think I started actually diving into self-development things until I was probably in my late 20s. So I think I missed several formative years of having maybe a mentor or just even picking up a book. And, you know, you've heard it a million times, leaders or readers, but it's like, it's so true. Like to dive into mindset and to dive into self-development, whether that be, it doesn't matter what arena it's in. It could be to be a better person, coach, um, athlete or whatever you're doing. But I think that for many years, I didn't think that that was an important piece of the puzzle. I thought that just developing skills maybe in the bodyguard realm was mm -hmm. important, but it doesn't matter how much skill set you have that if you can't bring your mind to meet your body and then kind of have those two coincide to make a really great, that's what makes a really great bodyguard or person in general. Oh, uh, that's interesting. So I've heard like the, the comparison of like soft skill and hard skill, mm -hmm. right? Hard skill being maybe the, like the dev tax stuff you were mentioning before the firearms training, things like that. And then the soft skill of being able to assimilate into a particular environment situation, also the situational awareness that's there. I mean, you're working with a team, plus you're working with a celebrity or an executive, whoever it might be, whoever the client is who has their own team, right. And their own personalities and whatnot. So you have to be able to settle in into that. Um, and I've kind of have also heard it referred to as kind of like your software. You don't quite have the software to deal with it all at the same time. So you mentioned time management being, being a thing. Um, I've seen, and I was a victim of this as a professional, like, well, in order for me to move up, I just have to work harder and longer than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'll just go grind, but that takes its toll. And to the, to the, to your point where you, you may, there's other things you could be doing from a self-development perspective, um, but you just grind. I mean, it's, it's not a 40 hour week. It's a 60, 80 hour week mm -hmm. and that'll get me there. That'll get me there. And pretty soon it catches up. Were there any pivotal points where you recognized you said for like, like the first four years, but were there any, was there a point there where you're like, damn dude, I need to reevaluate this. And this is what I want to do, but I can't keep doing it this way. For sure. Um, so kind of, you know, going through my career, like I said, I started in LA, I was there for a couple of years. And then from that point, um, I got a chance to start running my own details in the Bay area. Um, okay. more so jumping to the actual executive side. Um, so residential component, field component, um, both, both pieces there, but, um, kind of having my own team underneath my wing at that point. Um, that's a big step. It was a big step. Yeah, it was great. And that somebody was, did, somebody did take a chance on you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that was really great. I got to do that for a year here. Then I jumped, um, over to another detail on Santa Barbara doing uh, a similar type of detail, different, you know, person. Um, and that was really great. Um, but I think that was still that component where I wasn't feeding my mind as much as I was trying to feed the grind, you mm -hmm. know, and like you said, it doesn't matter. You can grind as much as you want, but if you're not working accurately, then it's not really going anywhere. Now you've heard this saying, but it's like, what are you doing today to move the needle? Mm -hmm. Like uh, you moved a lot of different pieces, but the needle, the needle stayed, didn't move. Yeah, yeah, it stayed. So okay. I think once we had our firstborn, me and my wife, Amanda, we had Cruz. That was the catalyst for change for me. Um, I knew that I wanted to move back to the Midwest actually. Um, so kind of spending, you know, five, almost six years in California and it was time to go back to the family, Midwest. like extended family. Or yeah. What? Like all of our family was there. I think that it was like, I was ready to buy a home. I was ready to like have some of those family. Components. I imagine it's a little bit easier yeah. to do that there than uh, in Santa Barbara. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I wanted to see my son grow up in the Midwest. I wanted my parents and her parents to be yeah. around him. And um, I think that's kind of when I started like, really diving into mindset. And then I also started at that point when I moved back to Michigan, I joined um, a team that was only travel. So I travel wherever I had to go, whether that was personal appearances or, you know, even flying to California, staying here for a period of time before that client were to travel elsewhere. So I was always on the go, you know, two, three weeks at a time, at least sometimes a month. It's a know? lot. It was a lot of travel. So 
during that time, I was like, I met someone um, during that time. He was a mentor for me and he just started, I just, you know, when you meet someone, there's like, there's something different about this yep. guy. Like he, he's successful for a reason, but why? Like, mm -hmm. it's not just because he's successful. So like kind of getting the opportunity to start to pick his brain mm -hmm. and like really diving into how he thought and how he perceived situations and how everything was an opportunity for him. And like also how he really spent the time to learn. I think that was something I wasn't necessarily doing. It's such a critical component. If you want to get better, is like you have to take time to learn and to grow. Mm. And it's the first thing I do every day. I wake up, it's like read, get better for an hour, then some type of physical activity, whatever that is for you. I think that's vastly important mm. uh, component there. Um, but it just really taught me. I was like, he was another guy that was like, he wasn't just working hard. He was also working smart. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of parallels you could draw to, well, all the things that happen in the gym and probably an EP, but it, it's it, today's, today's day and age, what people are trying to do is just kind of gobble up everything there is to gobble up and then move on to the next thing. Like they teach me all the secrets coach, you know, just show me the, the quick way to the end here and to the, to the success. And you know, what you realize over time is that there really is no quick way, but that goes to the learning piece, which is if you don't pump the brakes and kind of, and then in the immortal words of uh, Ferris Bueller, you know, <laughs> life moves pretty fast. And if you don't stop to take a look around, you just might miss it. There's so many things, the nuance to pick up in those, those very, very specific situations that, that then create very, very specific outcomes on with, with regard to how you handle things. That is such a huge piece for the most you know, for su being successful in whatever it is, whether it's your relationships, your job, you know, your health, your wellness, your fitness on, the, you know, on the firearms range, whatever it else. I just, I just see people wanting to kind of accelerate things and, and not slow down. Um, and, and again, smell the roses for lack of a better term. Um, traveling two to three weeks out of the month as a, as a young person sounds like a good time, right? Like <laughs> I've done it. Like I did that for a while for, mm -hmm. for a big corporation where I was on, you know, planes, trains and automobiles. And, you know, staying in hotels and, you know, getting your know, jet setting from here to here, going to major metropolitan cities, whatever. That sounds fun. Like mm -hmm. for the, from the outside person looking in, can you talk about the realities of that? I mean, yeah. there, there was some fun to it for sure, but can you talk about the realities and the impact that that has on your mindset and your health and your relationships and your career? Yeah. I do agree. It is very fun. Like I, I loved every second of it. Don't regret uh, an ounce of it. It was, you know, I got to see and do things that it's once in a lifetime, especially within this industry, you know, you're, you're with people protecting them to go do some of the coolest things that they're, you know, they're doing in the world. So of course you're going to be a part of some really, you know, once in a lifetime opportunities and things, which is great, but it, it absolutely takes a toll on you. Um, I think that's one thing we see in the EP industry in general is, you know, whenever anyone gets an EP, you don't necessarily start doing personal protection when you get an EP. Maybe you start at the residential side of things, you know, so you're at the house or maybe you're in an office space, you know, doing their security while the executive's working or however that, you know, transpires for you. A lot of times you start at nights, you know, and work your way up till you're the, you know, the guy that's doing the personal protection. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, everyone wants that piece of the puzzle where I'm doing EP, right? I'm, I'm doing what I signed up for, but the harsh reality that of that is, is you're gone a lot. You're going to miss, you know, milestones in your family's lives and your kids' lives. And you're going to sacrifice a lot for it because the reality of EP is that you're there to guard someone else and protect their life. And you do that by living their life. Um, and I think that's a piece of the puzzle that is very exciting and very alluring at first to people is like, Hey man, this is going to be awesome. I could do all these things, but I'm like, yeah, but you're going to be up two to three hours before them and in bed two hours after. That's them. not sexy. It's not yeah. sexy. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, after a while, people are like, okay, this is taking a toll on me. You know, I've seen, seen it in the field firsthand where I, I see a guy a year later that I haven't seen and he's put on 50, 60 pounds. I'm like, man, what happened? He's like just eating like crap on the road, touring or, mm -hmm. you know, doing whatever, not taking care of themselves. And I'm not saying everyone's like that, but a vast majority of people, there's a high burnout rate in this industry and it can... I think on the back end, if you're not careful, it can really sabotage personal relationships that like in any other career, sure. but especially this one where you're gone and it's like fast paced, fast paced. So it's yeah. like, you got to be very careful to make time for your family when you're on the road. That's something I set in stone was no matter what I was going to FaceTime my kids, you know, three to four times a day. I did that all the time. Um, 
you know, still have my time in the morning to, like I said, get my mind right, train. Like I wasn't going to lose those bad, those, those good habits or replace them with bad ones, which is also another component on the road. It's very easy to do that, right? You, it, you reach for convenience when you're on the sure. road in a lot of ways. Um, you know, whether that be with food or pleasure or whatever it is. It yeah. Cause it's, it's like, there's, there's a routine, but it's not a routine. Right. Right. It's like, I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. Well, I do know, but right. I don't know what's really there because what I'm doing is basically scoping out the area and making yeah. sure I understand this and that about my travel routes and all that kind of stuff. But you know, the last thing that comes up is where the hell am I going to get lunch? You know, or where, sure. you know, where am I going <laughs> to, yeah. you, know, you know, or where am I going to, you know, where am I going to take up, you know, five minutes to kind of collect myself or whatever else? It just, those, those things don't come up. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and that's what I've been told anyway. And then all of a sudden there's a change of schedule. Right. You know, so what you had planned all of a sudden can go, you know, a very different, different direction. Um, let's talk, let's talk about the job a little bit, because we've talked about sort of, you mentioned terms like C-suite, uh, there were celebrities in there uh, that, you, you know, that you mentioned. And can we talk just a little bit about like the typical clients that you're kind of working with and like without obviously naming names and whatnot, but who are these people? Like what, what, why do these people need executive protection? For sure. Yeah. So obviously you are touching the C-suite, you are doing executives, you are doing celebrities, but I think the, one of the vast majorities or the big components that people forget about, um, and kind of how I was talking to is people nowadays, um, normal everyday people are using security more and more. Um, there's a statistic out there that I think it was, um, now more than ever is like I think the statistic was 12%. Um, there was a 12% increase in threats towards um, an overall uh, executive in their, basically in the current day and age, right? Um, and a lot of those threats are through, um, you know, their cyber, right? But the other component of that is like, if I give you a cyber threat, what do you want? physical security to that. Right. Yeah, and right. it doesn't mean it's always going to a C-suite. It could be to a policymaker, a decision maker, um, you know, anyone that's making decisions that are going to affect in and kind of, uh, yeah, essentially that affect other people's lives. And like, that's, that could be, you know, just a normal mother and father. And, you know, people are really great nowadays about finding other people's personal information online. Oh, so it's the, easy. It's easy. We, well, right? we've made it easy. And they, quite frankly, they've made it easy. For sure. You basically, if you think about Facebook, Instagram, uh, even TikTok, all these social apps, that you know, locations and pictures, and whatever, you basically just gave your enemy a target package. If that's the way you want to look at it. I mean, you effectively just said, well, here's my life. Here's why I'm on a regular basis. Here's where I am right now. I'm not at home right. or whatever else. Like you, if you just set, set yourself up for that to right. some, some extent. And so it made it uber easy. Sorry. I kind of cut you off. No, you yeah. Didn't. It's to me, that's wild. Like I, I look at what the stuff put people put out there and I'm like, dude, like, really? Like you, that just, that's a little, that seems like a little much to me given right. your position or, you know, you're not a well-liked guy for whatever the reasons are, you know, right. and uh, you've just given people kind of like uh, an inside look at if they wanted to do something or, or get at you for whatever the reasons might be, you, you gave them a huge helping hand. And, you know, yeah. I'm sure that's something that you have to look out for as a, as a, um, as a protector is it's not just like what's happening physically on the ground from like from the grocery store to the office, but also what they're doing when they're not with you in the privacy right. of their own home or for, for, for God's sakes, like, you know, sitting on the toilet, scrolling through and posting or, for sure. or sending messages or whatever, you know? Right. And that's a huge component of where we're at in the EP industry is a lot of clients that we're serving are, they want both things. They want, um, you know, that cybersecurity. So we have GSOCs basically our intelligence centers that are providing, you know, real life, you know, now level intelligence to our EP agents on the ground. Um, and I think that's, you know, my current company crisis 24, that's what we do really well is we integrate those platforms very well. And that's what people are looking for nowadays, right? Like any company business person is like, like I said, attacks come through cyber. It might come through an email, it might come through a phishing attempt, a doxing, any of these modern day cyber attacks, but they're going to be played out in the physical realm. So you have to have a company that can do both nowadays, okay. a multifaceted company, right? I want an intelligence center 
that can give me that information of who is doing it and what they're saying. And I need a great company that can, you know, stand up protection in whatever form that is, whether that's my office, my home, traveling with me. And that's what Crisis 24 does well. We do that very well. I think, you know, being backed by our parent company, Garda World, um, you know, the largest private security company right. in the world right now, it's like we have a vast amount of resources to provide our clients with those, all those broad scope of things. And it's, like I said, it's different for everyone, but um, yeah, I think that's a common mis misconception is that everyone's following you around with an earpiece and yeah. a black suit, but it's just not the case. It's, it will look different for any other person. And sometimes you're doing security that is, it's for a dad or a mom that made a decision at work that affected a lot of people. And maybe they got life-threatening advice or not advice, but li life-threatening emails or phone calls with that because their information was provided online. And they're like, I'm terrified in my own home working remotely right now. And it's like, you know, we do security for those people as well. They're just normal everyday people that are, you know, they're making big decisions. So um, I think that's something to keep in mind is like, obviously you can't talk people out of what they're going to do. But a lot of times is like, we look at people and we're like, you know, this guy's making this, maybe he is not even C-suite, but it's like, he's making this decision. It's like, yeah, but he's still a person. He has a family, he has a personal life. And it's like those things, everyone deserves privacy in that realm. And I think that's obviously where we come in and is like, we know that, like, we know that like, um, this person deserves privacy. He deserves to feel safe in his own home we with all his do. own children. Right. Like everyone deserves that. Like, so I think that's, that's where we fit in, um, just kind of in the broad scope of the EP realm. It's different, you know, very different. It's a different landscape right now, especially in the past couple of years. I can't imagine. I mean, I want to talk a little bit about that because there's, I mean, there's so many changes. I mean, I live smack dab in the middle of the Silicon Valley. I mean, it's, wildly different now than it, than it was, uh, in so many ways, but, you know, you're just kind of touching on the, you know, the normal everyday person who all of a sudden has found themselves in a position, maybe not because they wanted to be there. They, you know, that was their career path to get there, but all of a sudden they are making decisions, um, that put them at risk for, because there's somebody out there that disagrees with their, with their decision-making mm -hmm. or decision-making process or the company that they work for, which now has inadvertently made them made them a target. Um, so yeah, I want to circle back to like the working at home thing. Um, you know, I can think I can relate to that because still most of our clients, even here at the gym are still working from home. They were all tech somewhere involved in the tech industry, uh, or some type of tech tech support. Um, and God, it's been hard, you know, yeah. and they've had to make decisions about where their kids are going to school, are they going to school, whatever else. And a lot of these people, quite frankly, actually have quite a few like HR representatives. And like, this is the toughest thing I've had. I never, I did not sign up for this, mm -hmm. you know, and all the decisions they've had to make around, you know, let's just say COVID protocols and people getting, you know, their, their paychecks cause they're moving and they're living somewhere else. So now they're mm -hmm. making the cost of the, the living wage, wherever they're living versus where they were before all of these things that are really, I mean, emotional for people and from a logical perspective have cost them money or whatever else. So it's created a lot of angst. It's created sort of a lot of nervousness. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of shifts in the last couple of years is the political climate is wild, right? The economic climate, obviously wild. Um, and then obviously from a health and wellness perspective, mm -hmm. layer all that stuff on top of one another. And it's, uh, it seems like a recipe for disaster, man. I feel like, <laughs> do you ever sleep? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think you're right. Like the landscape has shifted for everyone. So I think everyone's feeling the heat as of late, um, especially in the last couple of years, that's obviously no secret. Um, but I think that we, what we've obviously seen, like you're talking about is your clients both mostly work remotely right now. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not seeing as much of that, like, you know, security driven posture in office buildings or necessarily in person, but we're seeing a lot of like emergency response posture, um, you know, more of a proactive uh, approach to things, um, somewhat of a covert style security, not so much in your face all the time anymore, because it's just, it's not driven in that capacity. We don't need uniform style security on site an office anymore, right? right because right. people aren't going in an office anymore. So, um, I think that's the biggest shift we're seeing is how can we provide security to remote workers um, on a day to day. And that's, like I said, that's driven through, you know, real time intelligence through our GSOC centers, uh, making sure that information is gathered and then, uh, you know, basically driven to the proper party. 
and then also our boots on the ground actioning that information. So I think that's the biggest thing we're seeing right now is, um, you know, there's always going to be a need for personal protection bodyguards. That's that's not going away anytime soon. But I do think that we're seeing that, um, you know, that um, protection at the office is just it's being um, essentially carried out in a different form. It's it's not the same, but it's a huge component that I think is starting to take place right now in the industry. I wonder how that if and if it does change the culture of the work environment that you're in, in terms of how people kind of report, respond, operate on a daily basis, um, working for a large agency when you're not going to an office and we're not, um, it, th does it change how you, you know, what type of a, um, an employee that you're looking to hire those types how, how has it changed how you do yeah. business, I guess, is what I'm asking outside of what you've already mentioned. Yeah, for sure. No, I think it, it definitely does change, um, the way, you know, we don't want, it's not the same type of security. So you're obviously looking for different personnel. You're still looking for a very skilled person. They still have to go through the same training and stuff that we do, but we're looking for, like you've talked about, you have to have those soft skills because you're blending in a lot. Um, I think that's the thing that we're looking for is for someone to have soft skills and to, you know, be approachable, um, customer service driven almost to a degree. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's, that's hands down across the board in the EP industry in general. I think a lot of people think that, uh, you know, you're just a big people mover and you need to, you need to just go in guns blazing, but actually the best bodyguards are the best. I mean, they're, the, they're people persons and they can, you know, they can talk their themselves into any room and basically, um, they have great connections and they have those soft skills that we've talked about. So I think that's what we're looking for. We're not necessarily just looking for like, you know, the, the military driven individual anymore, but we're looking for that person that does have, um, a mindset of like, you can train them in different aspects, you know, whether that be uh, a covert style of like surveillance detection, um, and then being able to shift gears to be in like personal protection all of a sudden or a residential component. So it's like, we're kind of creating like this, um, it's like this morphed identity like of a hybrid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For lack of a better term, it's a hybrid of like, um, yeah, just of security. It's, you know, we want our guys to be multifaceted. You have to, you know, technology is coming into place. So you have to be able to operate technology. Well, you know, you have to be able to, um, work with local PD. Well, there's a lot of skill sets that you need in modern day security that just, you didn't need back in the day, you know? And I think that's, I think that's a harsh realization. Some people are getting in is they're getting into security now thinking that, I'm going to jump right into being a personal protector. And that's just, that's not the truth. Like you're going to have to do your bidding and do your time, do those night shifts. And then you got to learn everything, all, all facets. So it's interesting. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, for a long time we were, what my experience was and the people that I was interacting with were almost all ex military, some ex uh, or current police officers actually that were doing kind of um, the, the moonlighting gig. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause it provided extra money for them and, or they were, you know, they just had extra time, right. They were maybe working part-time in both and it just worked out for them. I guess my point of that is, is they came in from usually particularly at this kind of a little younger than I am now, but they'd come through the military and they'd spent time maybe even as a contractor, you know, uh, diplomatic security working for different agencies, uh, you know, private contract agencies. And the, that's a very different type of protection when you're running through, say, the streets of Iraq or Afghanistan um, or some other war-torn country, Africa or whatever, um, where, you know, it's head on a swivel all the time. You're in full kit. Uh, you know, you're in armored vehicles constantly, whatever else. But that's not that's not what we're talking about here. No. So again, going back to the, what's the day to day like for these, these professionals and what are they doing? Protecting all these different types of people in the, in the ways that you mentioned cyber to, you know, the, the, the personal threats that come in, what does it look like out there for them during the day? Like what, what are they doing? Like, how does yeah. the day start? How does the day finish? What does it actually look or feel like? Cause I think a lot of people have this, you mentioned it before, like black suits, white shirt, black tie, yeah. dark glasses, earpieces, talking into their cuff of their, you know, secret service style stuff. For sure. Can you give us some perspective on, you know, what, it, what the day to day would be like? Yeah. I mean, you know, to be honest, which this is both a negative and a positive, a lot of days are boring in this profession. Right. But, um, it's also another component of, of you can't wake up and assume that every day is going to be the same or every day is boring. There's a lot of interesting moments and a lot of interesting situations that you get yourself into out there. Um, so I think that's the, that's what sets apart a good protector and a bad protector, right? You wake up every day, even though today, today might appear, appear normal, it could completely go and do a 180 on you. So I think that's, 
that's something to keep in mind. It's happened many times over the course of my career, but I, I think it looks very different for any anyone. Um, you know, a residential component, you're going to wake up and you know you're ensuring that that person's property is protected, or you know whoever's coming and going is supposed to be there. Obviously that's somewhat self-explanatory. There's a lot of nuances in that because you're dealing with staff and you're dealing with, uh, you know, the principal themselves. But, um, you know, the aspect that I did a, a good portion of my career in was, was field work. And the reason I did that was because not too much of the days were the same. Um, you know, you wake up and maybe you go to an office with whoever you're going with, you go to their place of work. And then the next thing you know, you're doing a, a public speaking engagement. The next thing you're doing a dinner, um, you know, you're going throughout this person's life with them. You're at a gym with them. You're doing all these different components. So it looks very different on a day to day. Um, but you also have that other, like I said, you have the other side where it's like, oh man, this is like a boring day. I've sat in the office for 14 hours a day. Why this guy's been in meetings all day or, but that's the part of the job is like, be really careful you don't get complacent in those moments because it's it happens so quick and i've seen it happen where it's like you're walking down the street the same path that you walk almost every single day uh not by choice obviously an ep you want to vary your path but most of the principles they want to do what they want to do they want to continue to live their lives so mm -hmm. you provide what you can provide in those you know those circumstances but it doesn't take much for someone to tap them on the shoulder and you're like well where did this guy come from you know like and they're interacting with your principal and you're like that happens so fast what was the first one that happened for you that really was like, oh shit, this is real? Uh, you know, it wasn't so much of like a security uh, breach, thankfully, but it was like when I was doing the celebrity stuff in LA, I was young coming out and it was paparazzi. Like th those guys are <laughs> sneaky in LA, man. Like they just pop up out of the middle of nowhere. So that was one that was like, you know, my very first paparazzi is like, you know, the lights here. It's like, you're like a deer in the headlight. The first one you're like, and it happens so quick. You're like, walking out to a vehicle and all of a sudden it's like click, click, click. And it's just this chaos. And I was like, wow, like I got a lot to learn here. Cause you're just like staring at the light, the camera, you're not exactly situationally aware of how many people are here, who is supposed to be here. Like you don't really know those things cause there's fans involved. There's, there's other components to, to that stuff, you know? So, um, I think that was one where I was like, I got down to the situation. I'm like, yeah, I need to like really amplify my, uh, situational awareness, my, Vigilance. No, my, yeah, yeah, my vigilance, my surroundings. I need to like be better. I mean, um, you know, most of attacks happen in or around a vehicle. Like that's a statistic. So I think that's, you know, you need to be very careful when you're going in and out of those situations. And it's like I talked about, it's like, you know, if you're a celebrity bodyguard or any bodyguard and you're just assuming that your client is walking to a vehicle and you're strolling along, it's like, don't get complacent in that. Like, and I think that goes, that transcends throughout life. Like, don't just do the same motions every day. Like, don't just go in the gym and do curls on Friday because it's Friday, like switch it up, do something else. You know right. what I mean? Like, so, um, yeah, complacency is a, it's a killer. It's a killer, like a real life. Like it, I think it kills both, um, obviously your mindset, um, in and around anything in life. Um, if you're just a complacent person, I think it can just take you down obviously beyond your career, but your personal life and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's something that should be avoided at all costs is complacency. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, drives all kinds of, uh, just say shit behaviors yeah. and, uh, and there's usually those outcomes are no good either. Mm -hmm. Any, any time where you've seen an agent be complacent or sure. get caught off guard that you can share where it was, this is no joke. Like this person, there was injuries involved or there was attempt on life or anything, anything that serious. Yeah. I mean, I think I've seen it where, um, without getting overly specific where, you know, someone got, they had been with a, you know, a particular public figure for a period of time, they got complacent in their routine while the, you know, that other person was conducting their normal routine and thinking you can get away with little, uh, little cutting corners, little or cutting corners, little breaks and stuff. And that's, that's when things unfold and you see, you see a lapse in coverage, right? Like, I think that's, I think it's the thing we've seen around presidential attacks or any type of assassination is like, um, you know, a soft target, right? Like you look at the security and you go, and there, that's a soft target. This is going to be easy versus like looking at that president being like, that guy stared me right in the face and he saw me coming from a mile away. I'm not touching that guy. Right. It's like, I've been made. Yeah. Yeah. And it's goes back to that complacency factor is like, you just assume that you can get away with certain little things. Are we in the business? We call it like getting on the tracks where you think that like, you think that you're kind of, you're in, like you're in with either that person or you're in with that family or that you kind of like, you're good to go. You're comfortable. Like, you're comfortable. Like this is a, I have a great job. I'm doing cool things. This is a forever thing for me. And that, that couldn't be, 
uh, that's right. just the worst mindset you can yeah, have. Yeah, because I was just going to say, like, complacency is usually preceded by comfortable. Yep. Right? And when we get that comfortable, then we become complacent. For right? sure. And, yeah, I think that's that's what I've seen in the business too much is just really, they're great guys, but they just get complacent. And they're just, they assume that, you know, nothing bad's going to happen. I know the day-to-day. And then, you know, something bad does happen and they weren't ready for it. Um, so I think that's just something that, I know now definitely I breed with guys is like, how can you keep your mind spinning 24 seven? Like whether you're sitting in a vehicle waiting on someone or outside of a doors, what can I look at right now? What's, and I had a guy, he was, he you're hunting. Me, yeah, you're hunting. And right. he would, he'd, he'd be a guy and he's like, I'm not trying to freak you out, but he's like, you know, you should always be thinking of like, how could, how could this go bad right now? And what would it look like if it went bad? And that would just one that keeps your mind going. So you don't get complacent. And two, when something bad does happen, you're already ready for it. You're a step ahead. That's that downloading that software, right? Like sure. you've already thought through the process and you know, the way I look at this in, in life and it's kind of going back to the complacency and, and the vigilance that we're really talking about here. And one's you're, you're being paid to have it. Uh, and it's important that you have it because it's not just your principal. It's also you that could be at risk here in your job. There's a lot of liability there, but I think there's protectors and then there's those that need protecting. And uh, the protectors are the ones that are always thinking, or at least continually trying to think through the, in this type of a mindset. So going back to the mindset piece and what I find is the, those that need protecting are the ones that are looking at those protectors with that mindset going, dude, you're fucking paranoid. Right. Like what? That's no way to live life. Like, you you know, always thinking something bad is going to happen. And my take on, on this is, has been like, I don't think anything's bad's going to happen. I just want to be prepared. If something should happen, whatever gets thrown at me, I just want to be ready for it. So there's a, I could take a minute here and establish a few things like, what's the exit route look like at this, in this particular building or in this, like I was just at a very public, like outdoor concert the other day. And mm-hmm. I was with my daughter and with my dog and we were just kind of hanging out and it was packed and it was a music margarita festival thing that was happening in a, in a, on a, like kind of this big outdoor venue. I guess my point is, is I was, look, there's an exit over there. There's an exit over there. I'm not trying to go that way. If anything goes down, it's probably going to happen over there. Oh, there's a guy, group of guys over there that's had way too much to drink already. I know that that's going to end, end up like, uh, you know, people are coming up trying to pet the dog, you know, and trying to have conversation, whatever else. For me, it's just like, I'm just being aware. I'm not drinking at this thing. I want to be, you know, I want to be totally, he- you know, lights on, heads up, like, uh, you know, I'm having a good time enjoying right. everything, but I've assessed kind of my situation and to your, to your point, that situational awareness is there. That puts me in the power position. Mm-hmm. So I don't get behind the power curve as fast as maybe somebody else says. It doesn't mean bad shit can't happen. And, you know, I've got it handled. Right. Um, but, but I feel for me, it's just like, no, I'm I, okay. I know where I'm going to go. If something happens, like now I can get back to it, enjoying my, my time here and listening to the music and whatever right. else. Uh, versus the other side that looks at that going, dude, that's paranoid. You're being paranoid, you know, to think like that every day that, uh, you know, it's just all the bad things are going to happen. I don't think that at all. It's not how I think. Could you speak to that a little bit? For sure. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I had someone within the business and he would say anytime, cause we would wear, you know, we were a bulletproof vest a lot of the time. Um, and he would say, you know, when you put this vest on, instead of saying today, like nothing's going to happen, say, could today be the day? And Could it be like when you walk into a situation, it's not like you're trying to like freak yourself out or freak others out around you. In fact, it's like, I mean, we've seen it all too much lately where it's like these situations are unfolding every single day. So how do we know that today is not going to be the day for us? And I'm not saying that makes that's not being living in a paranoid state. It's living in a prepared state. And like that's. You know, like we said, that can go in a lot of different areas of your life, but like walking into a situation, being prepared for you and your family is your greatest chance at success if something were to happen. And maybe it's not even an active shooter, right? Maybe it's a medical situation. You're like, my gosh, I just, I noticed that AED when I walked in, or I noticed, you know, there was an EMT on site and I'll go to that person. And it's like, maybe you're not saving just your family's life. You're saving someone else's life in this situation. And also like, maybe you're just avoiding a lot of heartache. You know, that those guys have had too much to drink, but you're situationally aware enough to be like, instead of ruining my night and my family's night by these drunk idiots, I'm going to keep clear. And now me and my daughter had a great night. And like, that's just, that's covering all bases. Like, you know, it's just being smart. So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with preparing yourself. It doesn't mean you're a doomsday prepper. Right. And it just means that you're, you're taking precaution. And like, that's smart. Like, that's just, 
that's being an advocate for your own success and survival. Like, I think every person should be that. Like, if you're not walking to a room and saying like, taking a good look around, I, th I, I bet you most people would say like, if they walked into a room and they left that room, they probably couldn't tell you too much about who was in it or what, what the, you know, what was actually in the room itself. So I, that's a good activity to start from is like, walk in a room, like, what did you notice about that room when you left? And it's like, if you recall, and you couldn't, you couldn't recall a face or an item that was in that room. It's like, man, were you even connected? Yeah. Were you even connected? You like one, I think that goes into the mindset of like being present. Like, I think you're ultimately the most happy and the most successful when you're present, just like in these situations yeah. present with you here. Um, and then also, I think that like, when you see red out of anger or out of just being completely mm. oblivious or your mind's still at work when you're with your family. Um, I think that's a portion that's like keeping you from being present. So I think there's multiple aspects of why being present is just not healthy for you. Um, uh, let's keep going down this path because so here's another example that I'll give you that I think like people struggle with. If I've tried to explain it to them that may not quite understand the concepts we we're just talking about there. And looking at more as a paranoia than a preparedness, which is a huge principle in my life. Just being prepared for lots of things, financially being prepared, emotionally being prepared, physically being prepared, um, and psychologically, emotionally, having tools that I can use, you know, whether they be uh, practical or, or physical or, or idealistic tools. I guess my point is, is like... Uh, this has been a tough one for people to understand for me. And I deal with it a lot where I live kind of in, in where I work. And that is being situational aware about the individual who looks like they might be a little bit off. Mm -hmm. Right. And so and, and I have compassion. I really do right sure. up until the point where it could be a physical threat to my business, my customers, myself, my family, the people around me, whatever, whatever the case. So you know, I see somebody and I'm like, Hey, keep an eye on that, that person over there. And to the, I guess the normal everyday person who maybe doesn't think like I do, that could be, dude, that's really judgmental. That mm. person clearly has, you know, is homeless or whatever else. And that doesn't mean they're a piece of shit. I didn't say they're a piece of shit. Right. I just said something. I have a spidey sense here that that's not, you know, not something's right. up, mm -hmm. something's up. It's a little, they're a little cagey. And I just want to be aware. And I want you to be aware that 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 person exists. And because I've seen it enough times where people that kind of fit that identity or that description have been an issue in For one sure. way or another. And most of the time it's like, all right, they may be verbally accosting you or, you know, making you feel a little uncomfortable getting in some personal space, but are they, are they really a threat? But that goes back to you were saying, well, maybe they are today. Maybe they're not the other sure. 364 days of the year, but on today, today they are. How do you, so going through this mindset process, um, how do you explain this to people um, outside of the way you just did, like your family, you know, like they, obviously you're a, you, you know, you're, you're a husband, you're a, you're a dad and they know what dad does, right? D dad does. But how do you have these conversations with like your kids or like your people that just c can't quite get it without making it seem like it is doomsday and, yeah. and just crazy business all the time. For sure. I, I think to kind of revert back is like when you see something, say something. Um, okay. Think, you know, I think a lot of times I'm sure there's multiple situations as of late. If people would have said something, it might have it might have done something, right? So oh God, like, I couldn't agree with you more, particularly like, with like these active shooters and whatever. Like 100%. they've slid through systems. Like yeah. people so, saw this was written all over. I mean, our Three letter agencies have them on record and right. have files on them, but nobody's doing, nobody's saying anything. But here's, about. here's why I think that is, is because we're scared to hurt people's feelings nowadays. Oh, it's so here's the thing you can do it politely. <laughs> so what I tell people is if you see something, say something, and if it's nothing, the worst case you did was hurt that person's feelings. Maybe, maybe they didn't even care, but maybe you saved a lot of lives that day, or maybe you, you know, a situation didn't unfold that was going to, but it's like, you can't be, you can't. And, and sometimes in the safety world and, and the security world, you can't be scared to help, like to basically to hurt people's feelings. Like, so if I'm protecting a person or a situation and you look out of place to me, I can't say, I can easily go up to you and be like, Hey, like you look lost. How can I help you? Or like, what, you know, what, what's going on today? How are you doing? And then you can kind of size that person up. It doesn't mean I have to go and be like, you're out of place. Get out of here. Right, right? right. It's like, Hey, like what's going on? Like, talk to me about why you're here. Or like, if we do that all the time in the EP world, you're like, this dude is creeping me out. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go up to him and have a conversation with him. And like, I see you, I know that you're here. 
and I'm going to get to know you a little bit You're more. You're doing it respectfully yeah, yeah. and confidently. Yeah. There's an Abraham Lincoln quote. I think it's like, um, I don't like that guy. I must get to know him. Something like that. <laughs> okay, so it's like, can't believe I don't know that. Yeah. One. I think, I think that's a, it might be it. Um, but a paraphrase. Yeah. A paraphrase for sure. Why well, it's just probably not Abraham Lincoln at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, the thing is, is like, don't be scared to hurt someone's feelings. Just, you, you know what you're trying to do. If, if you're hurting someone's feelings by being arrogant or by being oppressive on them, or that's one thing, but to go up and ask them a question because you think it's going to get you maybe to an answer that you think is necessary or to say, you know, if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, which I mean, obviously there's a lot of women and children. I don't want my wife or my son or my daughter to walk up to someone and say, what are you doing here? But I can point a police officer and say, Hey, you know what? Something about that guy is just a little off. I can't tell you what it is, but my gut can tell you that it's a little off. Why don't you keep an eye on them? Check it out. And you know what? They're going to go. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe you saved who know how many, you know, maybe he was tweaking out and he had a heart attack or like you, you may saved his life from a medical emergency. For yeah. Sure. Whatever right. that is. I mean, but it's like, if you see something, say something like it's not that hard of a concept. And it's like, I think we get it caught and like, I mean, it's kind of an everyday life where it's like, you see something wrong and you're like, well, someone else is going to say something, right. but that's, you can't pass the buck with things like this. It's the classic, like in the, you know, in the industry, when you're doing medical stuff, like what's one of the first things you think you teach people and to like to tell someone during a medical scenario, call, call 911. 911. But it's yeah. the first thing people forget. I can't tell you how many times I've been part of a, a, you know, a heat stroke or a heart attack. And I'm like looking around, I'm like, there's six people here. I'm like, who's Did called? anybody call? And they haven't, and right. they haven't, it hasn't been done. So it's like, we're just, we can't have an assumption that someone's going to do something. I think if you see something and you take action, Worst case, you will hurt someone's feelings. You're being a good citizen is the way I look at it, right? There's, 100%. there's it's not being judgmental, it's being situationally aware. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that that is goes back to which one are you? And it really, if you're you're the the one it's defined by emotion, mm -hmm. right? It's defined the you're being judgmental if you're being emotional about it. You're if you're situationally aware, you're just being very rational and logical and going through your, some critical thinking skills here. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so important, but you're right. You hit the nail on the head and it's left room uh, for people to, again, I, I sort of alluded to it or mentioned is m move through systems and move past people and things and potential help and into really, really bad situations where it's gotten really dark, really fast for them. And they've made some really, really horrific decisions that have, that have impacted people in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're talking about there and kind of where we're going with this is kind of the mindset of protector and, and kind of how you're approaching things. All of the skills that you're talking about that would take to be sort of an, um, an EP agent or um, officer, depending on, I guess, what the, where you're working and who you're working with, mm -hmm. all of that stuff leads into leadership and all of those skills and mm -hmm. both the hard skills and the, um, and the soft skills, um, and the, and the software that you've downloaded. Can you talk about your transition into leadership? Um, how you did that and, and almost starting like over, like what were the things that caught you off guard or, or were the biggest challenges for you first? How did you overcome them? Was it easy? Was it hard? Maybe you can get into that a little bit. Yeah, sure. And I, what you're doing now for that matter, because yeah. we didn't really cover that. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, like, oddly enough, I got into leadership, like when I saw this transition, like during the pandemics, like security was changing. Right. So like I talked about, um, I wasn't necessarily working in the field anymore. You know, my job had slowed way down all this, these personal appearances, people were segregating themselves, right. right. They were, they were hermits basically, you know, no one wanted to be around people. So it was like, what's the need for a bodyguard? Like I'm staying at home. So for me, it was like, my job really dwindled down. And I was like, man, like, what am I going to do? So I saw the writing on the wall with the security industry changing, you know, that I was, I think I was furloughed for three months. I'm like, what am I going to do? Like I've done this for almost a decade. We were now. all there, dude. Yeah. Yeah. We were so all there. Luckily enough, I was able to get an opportunity to go do a different type of security work. Um, more of that like covert surveillance model. Um, and I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I'm like, this is kind of the future of security for me. People aren't going back to the office anytime soon. I don't care what anyone says. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, people will maybe start public appearances and those things again, but it's not going to be for a while, which, you know, in the industry, it wasn't for a long time. So, um, that kind of led me into like a period of time in my life where I was like, I think it's time for me to get out of the field. I've been doing this for nine years really? at this point. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I, I want to be done with the field. Like I got to, and I think at that point I was a shift in my mentality of like, stop chasing the sexy details and start focusing on people, uh, processes and making things better for, for all those things. So 
you know, making protectors lives better by being a good mentor to them, uh, by leading from the front. That's just a philosophy I think is you can't be a good leader, an effective leader. If you're not, you know, doing the things got to know the job, man, you know, the job, you got to be able to tell people to do things that you've either already done or that you're living it yourself. And I think that's like, that was my shift in in my mindset was like, I'm not going to be the type of leader that tells someone to like, go work a three week stretch and like say goodbye to your family. And I'm like, I want to be the leader. It's like, Hey, like when you go, this is, this is going to be a sticking point for you. This is going to be tough. Um, Here's what you can expect. And I think mentor people in those processes. And that's kind of where I really started to basically just develop those soft skills as a leader was just become a mentor first. Like, I think a really important piece of being a leader is start right where you're at. Like you don't have to hit a VP level to be a leader right where you are. And people forget that they're like, well, I need a promotion to be a leader. Why? It's you need, you don't need an, an, you know, an elevated title to start leading right where you are, lead right where you are right now. And that was advice I gave myself. I'm like, I can be a leader right now. I'm in a, you can be influential in your sphere, whatever that is. I don't care what you're doing. You can be influential in it in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment you start doing that right there, that's when you become kind of a thought leader and people start to gravitate towards your mentorship and also what you're saying, because you're doing it right where you are. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait to start leading. Do it right now. Do it today. And it comes from leading yourself first. I think you have to be a good leader to yourself. So I think like we talked about doing those right, the doing those things that you do day in and day out consistently that make you, you know, a better person, a better family man, um, whatever that is, looks like for you. Um, you know, for me, that's very spiritually driven every single day. Like I lead from a very biblical perspective. Like I think mm-hmm. Jesus was the best leader of our generation, like forever. Like there's no better leader to me. That man was like, I love when people say Jesus was a savage because he was. The legend, that's for, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like, I think to... I mean, and you know, that's not for everybody, but I think that you I should, it. Yeah, yeah, you should be making yourself better. And once you start that point of making yourself better, you can make those around you better, but it's really hard to be a good, effective leader when you're not making yourself better first. Um, so kind of doing that, like owning my own things, uh, progressing in, in my thought process, learning more, like we talked about, um, I was able to start, you know, um, transferring some of that knowledge and some of my skill set that I learned over the past decade in the industry and then beyond, you know, like getting people's mindset, right. I think a lot of times it's like, you can look at someone and you'd be like, man, you have so many skills, but like, you're still where you were three years ago. And it's, it's because their mindset's not correct. Um, and I think that's a component of anyone that's successful is like, there's guys that see sticking points and there's guys it's like man that's an opportunity right there yeah like, you know like i mean maybe for you maybe you i don't know you can tell me how this was for you but like you obviously saw that this area needed a certain type of gym and obviously you delivered on it walking into this place it's incredible so thanks man like what what for, i guess what for you was like okay like where can i deliver this stuff and how am i going to get here you yeah know? no i think it's a great question and um it really is centered around first putting boots on the ground. Cause I was in the corporate level for a long time and I needed to step out of that and get back to much like you actually had been working in a executive level job or, or director level job and, and moved back to the area to be closer to family. And I knew I wanted to stay in the industry, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to do somebody else's, you know, dream or whatever I had felt like I had enough skill set at this point and, and knowledge under my belt to, to begin a new journey and a new process, which is what I did. And, and, you know, over a, a several year period with a lot of growth and, you know, challenges along the way, saw an opportunity in an area that was, you know, underserved for the specific, you know, uh, services and uh, products that we could bring to the table. I saw from a customer perspective, I also saw an area that was underserved with regard to bringing in solid employees or solid coaches that wanted to level up and provide, you know, service at a different level. Um, And, uh, with that, it was interesting. Like I saw opportunity, um, and I had people telling me like, you're crazy, dude. Like, how could you, For sure. like, it's so scary. Like when I started the business was like coming off of 2008, like everybody's like, dude, you serious, man? Like, this is like the worst economic time of our, of our generation. Like, and you're going to do this. And I'm like, this is great. The money's cheap. Uh, rent is really like leases. I could get a really good lease at a really low level. And I went all in on myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's a big thing that people aren't taught how to do now um, in general is they're not, they're, they're, they're always, they're always asked to question, like, what are all the things that could go wrong versus what are all the things that could go right? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is an interesting, like kind of, 
I don't know, juxtaposition of what we were just talking about a few minutes ago about looking at things, you know, from a, from a preparedness perspective versus a, you know, I was going to say like a victim perspective on the right. other side, but I went all in and, and it wasn't really a question of whether I was possible or not, or whether I could do it or not. It was just, what do I need to do today to get there tomorrow? And then the next day, and then the next day. And so, yeah, it was taking all the skills and all the things that I had learned, but also recognizing, you know, that I don't, I don't know it all. And I never claimed to. So um, staying close with my finger on the pulse of what was going on sort of in the industry, particularly on the floor, you know, with clients and coaches and things like that till it got to a point where, all right, I can take a few steps back now. Cause I have, we've coached up some leaders that can do these kinds of things. And that's, it's, 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 it's really, you know, then you put yourself in a position to really be able to just kind of check in and make sure all the people that are, have jobs and know what their, their job is supposed to be, have the things that they need to do or that they need in order to do their job the best and be as successful as they can so that everybody wins. For sure. It's really, it really is like a simple formula. Yeah. Executing it on a daily basis is, it can be an entirely different thing. Right. And do you ever sit there and think like, what would have happened had you not taken action on a dream? Like how many people's lives that you've affected but would have never had those positive effects or this community? Like, do you ever think about that on the day to day? Like what, what if I would have, I would have had all this knowledge and skill set and known I was a leader and then never, like we talked about, I would have never said anything. Like I would have never done anything with it. Uh, yeah. So you're asking like, part of that is like, for me, it's like a regret question too. Do you have regrets? Yeah, I do have regrets. I regret that I didn't start it sooner. Right. Right. right? I, I do regret that. Um, I have, and then I was challenged at times with like, wow, all of this that I put into this and giving to people and, and, and making, uh, helping people change their lives. And, and I have, a, sometimes I have a little bit of a tough time, maybe with imposter syndrome, kind of for thinking, sure. thinking through that, right? Like, yes. come on, dude, you're just a dude. For sure. Right. And you're just, you know, it's a gym. It's not like, <laughs> you know. It's not like a Stanford hospital or whatever, where we're curing cancer or we're right. attempting to cure cancer or anything here. But the reality of it is, is we get this, this feedback from people on, look, man, like my life has completely changed mm -hmm. because of the things that you provided me or the, the, what you've helped me to realize and take action to your point to do. Um, I, I wished I had started this earlier. I wished you guys, you know, I'd discovered you earlier or whatever. I'd had this relationship or I'd been as motivated as and encouraged to do it by you, by what you guys provide here as, as, um, as I am now. And so I do think about it sometimes. I try not to stay too long in that. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's not, you don't want to stay there. Or, you know, what if, but like, you know, I was talking to my brother the other day and we were talking about this is like, you have the current skills to do what it is you want to do. You just might be scared to actually take the Totally, lead. man. You know, like to come here today to speak with you. I'm like, I don't have the skills to be on a podcast. I said the same thing, man. You know, yeah. like, like, I don't, I don't have the skills to start a gym. It's like, but you do, man. And you also yep. have the drive and it's like, Everyone, like you said, you said, I'm just a dude, but so is everyone that started anything. Mm -hmm. So like, I think to keep that in perspective is like, why not me? Why, why can't I be the next person that changes someone's life or makes a, a impactful business or whatever that is, writes the next book. I think that's people underestimate themselves a lot. Like don't mm -hmm. overestimate yourself and don't underestimate yourself. I always had a coach who would say, you're never as good or as bad as you think you are. Yep. I used to watch game film. I'd be like, I had a great game. I'd be like, have that great of a game or I had a terrible game. It wasn't that terrible of a game, but it's like, never underestimate yourself. Like you're not, you know, you're not as bad as you think you are. You're not also not as good as you think yep. you are. So, but that's a good posture to keep. It's like, I, this gym can get a lot better and also it could get a lot worse, yep. you know? So it's like, there's always something to put into that mix. Yeah. I've had to be, uh, take a little bit of a different approach to it in the last couple of years. Cause there's been so many things that were sort of outside of our control. Um, and for a guy that's very planned and, you know, very organized and very structured and in, in strategy and tactics to get certain things done. It was very, very hard kind of not knowing, not being able to see the future and, and having decisions being made that were way outside of your control that impacted not just me, but the, the hardest time I had was how it impacted first my employees and then the members. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always our, our, uh, our priority list here is, is, is very simple. And this is every, every employee here knows what that is. And it always starts with whatever we do, it needs to benefit the customer first and needs to benefit the, the, um, 
employees second. And if we just take care of those two things and we keep those at top of mind all the time, the company ends up getting taken care of. Right. So it's customers, employees, company. And it's just a simple, it's a simple priority list uh, of how to handle things. But when you can't have vision to like who it is you're trying to help right now and how it is you're going to help them, it was really tough. I really struggled as a leader, uh, kind of making it through the other side. And it did change kind of how I approach things now. Maybe, maybe I don't get so high or so low as maybe I used to. And I think that's an important aspect of being a leader is knowing when and, and how much and how, when to throttle up and when to throttle back. Um, but it doesn't come without being scared to death, you know, and me wanting to, you know, throw up sometimes like, but also being able to maintain a level of cool to where that one that doesn't happen and it's not being projected, you know, towards, those other people on the priority list when it, when it all possible. But um, yeah, you know, I guess just thinking, thinking back that one of the things that scared the crap out of me was even starting this podcast. I'm like, who's going to want to listen to this stuff? Right. You know, like who, who wants to listen to me talk or whatever. Right. And then you just do it. Right. You know, you, and you go in and you're scared and you, you have some reservations or whatever, but you do it with the intent of being better all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. And I guess going back to the EP thing and what you're doing as a leadership, as a leader within the, within the business, um, talk about like what the day looks like now as compared. So you're not boots on the ground. Like you used to be, mm-hmm. however, you stay closely. I know you stay closely intact with the people that are, can you talk about how that's how the job has shifted and what it looks like for, you know, a, a director in a global UP business on a day to day? Yeah. I think, you know, right now it's a, like, I love being a part of crisis 24 right now because we're st- still fairly, a fairly new company for the most part. I mean, Garda world's been around for a long time, but, um, you know, crisis 24 was officially, you know, founded in 2016 and then. Oh, started, that is very new. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, they, they had been around in a, in a different way, but it was, you know, office, officially called crisis 24 from crisis consulting in 2016. And then they kind of, they started buying up partners, right. They started buying fam international in 2020. They bought Gavin part of Gavin to Becker in 2021. And we just also acquired um, Patriot group of this year. It's fast moving. So it's fast moving. So I think what we're seeing is right now, it's an exciting time to be part of this company for me. Cause I can take a decade of experience of being the guy on the ground. We're getting multiple different companies coming together, trying to formulate SOPs that are one. Um, We're forming a new business alliance with each other in the industry. Um, I think also, you know, we're setting a different standard, um, kind of creating a culture. Um, One that's good to be a part of, you're seeing a melting pot of different companies come together, which is always an interesting dynamic, but one I really like to be a part of as a leader right now. Um, so I'd say my day to day though, is, um, you know, if, like I said, I've transitioned out of the field. So I oversee, um, probably close to, you know, 20 different teams right now. Um, so that's just agents that are all over the globe right now, uh, mostly domestically, um, some in the UK as well. Um, so overseeing those operations, um, mostly liaising with the leaders okay. that lead those details or mm-hmm. the lead, the programs, Makes and then sense. also the detail leaders across the board. So, um, a lot of day is just it's spent, you know, um, making sure quality is good, uh, bringing in new people, maintaining that quality, um, driving new business. Um, you know, being, I think the biggest shift for me now is, um, I kind of have this zoomed out view of what I wish I would have had when I was a protector. Cause when you're a protector, you see, why do I have to do this? Like right. dude, this policy is silly it's or stupid. Yeah. It's stupid. Like, why are we doing this? And then that now it's like, man, like I, you, you see, see it at a different, through a different lens, different lens. It's like it probably for you, it's like being a, you know, a person that's a member at a gym versus owning it. It's yep. things are involved, especially in EP and a gym, even it's yep. like liability is huge. So Massive. it's like, yeah. you know, decisions you make, I think now, especially myself is like, they're impactful. Like, um, you know, the way in which I work now is, is different. Like you make big decisions on a given it's day, like your clients, a hundred percent. So it's like, you gotta be very careful because when you implement something, you're implementing it for hundreds of people or maybe company wide. I don't really know, you know, depending on where I'm at, at the, on that current day or on that current scale, but it's, uh, you know, and then some days it's, you know, just a lot of days, I think you would probably uh, admit to this is like a leader's, uh, any given day, a lot of it's just keeping morale high, uh, encouraging people, really helping people in their career. I think mm-hmm. that's a huge portion of it because I think I know in terms of like 
for crisis 24 to be great or for, um, you know, red dot fitness to be great. Your employees have to be great. Yep. Like you'll never be great without them being great. So it's like, I spend so much of my day, uh, devoted to the other leaders in my company to just make sure that they're being the best they can be. And like, I think that always keeps me frosty. Cause it's like, you know, when you see certain little areas dip, you're like, Oh, am, am I dipping in that area? Like, I, f I feel like you should at least have that mentality as a leader is like, if something's dipping, don't look at it like who's doing the wrong thing right away. It's like, what can I how do, do we, in that area? Yeah, how can I impact that right? Right, now? like make it your problem. Make yeah. it your problem. Like, I mean, you know, Jocko talks about extreme ownership. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, I think that's that should be across the board is extreme ownership. So, I think that's that's kind of my day to day. And then just, I think, like I said, just uh, you know, f future endeavors. Like, where is Crisis Twenty Four going? It's just ever changing landscape right now in the EP realm. And it's like, like I said, we're we're getting a lot of new people in. So it's just, it's an exciting time to be a part of this industry for me. Like I can I tell because everything you just said that right there for the last couple of minutes, you did it with a smile on your face. So I can tell yeah. you're fired up about it. Like, it's, it's great. Just, like you ready, your, your feet hit the ground every morning, whether you're sitting behind a desk or, you know, on an airplane to go, whatever you're ready yeah. to go. I love it all the time. I love it too. I, that, that passion also the, uh, just the energy is, uh, you know, transmits, right. So I, I'm, I'm stoked to be here and, and be able to talk to somebody who's that fired up about it. And so I wonder just from an advice piece, and we kind of talked to, you know, to several different kinds of populations from, from those that are the civilians um, that you might call protectors to civilians that aren't protectors. They're mm -hmm. more, um, they need protecting or should have some protection. Then you have those that are, that are in the industry. If we could just kind of talk to those that are outside of the industry first, and then I want to talk about the ones that are in, mm -hmm. in terms of advice that you would give them right now. So for that person that's being, trying to be very vigilant right now about their family security, what they're doing on their day to day um, with all the crazy things that are happening in the world and the things that we're being exposed to and all the stresses and all the things that are, ha that are going on out there right now. What advice, if there is there, if there's one or two things that you might give them to help them maybe kind of organize themselves around being prepared, like the things mm -hmm. that you see, uh, you know, from your level that people are lacking um, when they think they know, but they don't really know what mm -hmm. is the thing they should focus on? Yeah. I think that one of the biggest misconceptions about personal protection is that it comes from a weapon on your hip mm. and it's not, it doesn't come any good EP guy worth or salt will tell you. It's like, hopefully I never have to pull that. Like if I haven't done my job and planning in advance long before that weapon's pulled, like something's gone vastly. Yeah. Wrong. You're way behind the power curve. Way behind the power curve. Ever, so yeah. it's like, I know, like, trust me, like, Hey, right to bear arms. I I'm down with it. Go with it. Like bear arms, but like you better have, you better be one of the sharpest minds in that room. I if you want to be, if you want to be prepared. So I think like, as you're increasing all these skills to maybe go to the, the range or do def tech or, you know, whatever it is that you find yourself doing is like, you really need to have the correct mindset going into those situations. And I think you did it really well. The other night is like, you weren't crazy with it. You're not like if something pops off, I'm pulling my gun and right. shooting from the hip. It's like, no, like I want to know where the exits are. I want to treat people like human beings and I want to like avoid circumstances. that are going to get me in trouble. So it's like, that's what I would tell people is like, just do, do your due diligence of like going into this situation, have a clear open mindset with it. Treat people like human beings. Like you don't need to like get aggressive with anyone to like, you don't need to get aggressive with anyone to keep a room safe. Like that's part of EP. Like if you're getting aggressive with someone, you've kind of to some degree lost your ground. You've crossed over. Yeah. You've crossed, you know, yeah, you've crossed over. So it's like, it, there's a threshold with everything. It's like, you don't need to go from, you know, checking out exits to like, I'm going to pull my gun. If this, like people need to like, there's a, a use of force continuum. And like, right. I strongly advise everyone to look at that. To like, understand what that is. Yep. Yeah. Look at that. And like, yeah, like, you know, just, be smart. Like be, I think the biggest thing is just being situationally aware. Like if this situation looks sketchy, what's the number one thing I could do? Leave it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, don't try yeah, to be, get out of there. Don't be a hero right now. Like, I mean, maybe there is a time obviously to be a hero where it's like, hey, like we said, talking or saying something or being proactive, but like, it doesn't look like always just like shooting from the hit. Like that's not being a hero. Like a, the, the smartest guy in the room wins time and time again. So be smart. That's the, that's the biggest piece of advice. I, I love that advice. It's so, so practical and it's, it's so, uh, um, actionable, right? I mean, you can start that right now, walking mm -hmm. out of whatever, wherever you might be listening to this or watching this right now, just go into your next situation and think like that. Now, so what about the person that's like, 
this is so foreign to me. Like I've never really thought about this. Like I just kind of go about my day or, um, I'm, you know, maybe I've, I don't know. I've had certain things afforded to me in my life where I really haven't had to worry about a lot of this. I live in an area that doesn't have a lot of crime or whatever else. What would you encourage that mindset or that person with that mindset to maybe do or think to help them maybe think a little bit differently, not be paranoid, mm -hmm. but think a little bit differently? Yeah. I just think that like, kind of like we talked about, I'm, I'm not saying everyone's putting on a, a bulletproof vest every day, but like, is today the day that this does happen to me? I obviously think, you know, you living in SF, you're seeing a lot of heightened crime in this yeah. area where you're seeing a lot of smash and grabs in people's vehicles. And it's like, those are just normal people that are walking in their grocery store and they're not thinking like, should I have taken my person with me or left it on that seat? But I accidentally left it on that seat just because I was lazy. But it's like, it takes- That's complacency, yeah, right? It's complacency. So I think the biggest thing for people is they actually, it's not that they're, it's a little bit of laziness involved in there. I think they're like, I don't want to lock that door because nothing ever happens. So it would have taken me two extra seconds to lock that door, or take my purse in the car with me. And then the next thing you know, you come back home, your house is broken into and your purse is gone. And it's like, if I would have taken two seconds to lock that door, or grab my purse off the freaking seat, like you would have been a different, you know? So it's like, it's like you said, it's not saying that like someone's going to break into my house or, you know, steal my purse off the seat, but it's like, how do you know that that's not going to happen? And what is taking two extra seconds to be, you know, proactive do, it doesn't do anything. Right. It just does good. So it's like, I'm not saying that everyone should be walking around with a gun on them. Like right. that's not being proactive. I think I don't think that either. Yeah. It's like, that's a very, you know, that's a whole different topic in and of itself. But I think everyone, everyone should be a proactive citizen in their, in their own personal safety to some degree. And whether that's locking doors or, um, you know, putting things away out of the, out of someone's line of sight or walking into a room and being like, that person's creeping me out. I'm a, you know, or you're what you're a female walking home by yourself or you're at the office. It's like, it's kind of goes back to that mindset of like, be smart and do the extra two second thing that could potentially save your life or save you a lot of heartache. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it, it borders on like, if you're not thinking like that, it's almost, there's a certain level of ignorance there. Right. And, and, and I, I, Again, that might hurt some people's feelings as we're going yeah. back to the feelings thing. But um, with if you're paying attention at all, like at all, even in the slightest bit, you know, these things are happening on a daily basis. And now we have access to them through all these different, you know, media centers, if you will, to to get this information. It's yeah. Take the two seconds. Don't be a victim. Um, don't act like a victim and don't don't behave like a victim, I guess, is what, what I'm saying. Because behaving like a victim on a daily basis puts you in that position to truly be a victim at the For end sure. of the day. Um, so we sort of covered those people. Maybe the last question here would be like, for anybody that's thinking about getting into the EP world, or maybe is even the, in, currently in the EP world and and looking to kind of make a change or make an entry into it, or maybe feels like they're a little burnt out, uh, you know, even just kind of maybe where you were like thinking differently, like, oh man, I'm I'm behind a little bit. Like I... I need to think about being a little bit more innovative because the, the, the industry is going that way. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give those people right now to, to, you know, maybe change their mindset to get them on the path to, you know, being successful in the business? For sure. I think this is like, this could apply to not just EP, but anything is, um, I think a lot of people are feeling burnout, especially in the past couple of years coming through, you know, remote, remote work has got people working, all, at all hours of the day and anything, or they're just feeling like um, a lack of purpose at work. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of the ways we, in which we find purpose is through helping others. And I think you could, like I've talked about earlier, I think you can do that in any position that you're in. Like, and I don't think it has to be your dream job to find that purpose, but I do think once you start to lean in and be like, you know, this is what I really like about, um, what do I like about one myself? Like, how am I my best self in this role? Like maybe for you, it's like, I love when I'm, you know, uh, being a personal trainer in the gym. I love, I mm -hmm. love personal training. So it's like, how can you lean into some of the skills to get you closer to what you love? Um, and that can be even in your a job that you don't like, you could be like, you know, there's, what's one part of my day that I do like, I love when the customer comes in and I talk to them and I, you know, get to know them. So do that more often and then find a way that you can do that on the daily and then find a way that you can make a living off of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think you can do that in any way, in any facet, any form. It's like, if you're burnt out, like 
find revert back to the things that bring you joy, not happiness. Happiness is fleeting. At uh, least. I love this. Yeah. You know, so it's like lean into the things that bring you joy on a, on a given day. And like, for me, it's doing this. I love talking with people and just speaking life. And like, I know that if I take that and I apply it into every area of my life, if I go into a podcast, if I go into my personal training session, if I go into my career and I'm speaking life into people, I know that at the end of the day, I'll be joy filled, not just happy. Like if I go and I'm just trying to be like, check a box in every room, I'll, I'll be happy because I check those boxes, but I won't be fulfilled. Um, so I think you can find that in any arena that you're in just by like leaning into the things that bring you joy and realizing like I've had someone tell me they're like, nothing's ever a life sentence. So I think we get into this, this mindset of like, because of what I'm doing now is what I'm always going to do. Yeah. Or I have to make this decision because it's going to dictate everything going right. down. Right. And it's yeah. like, man, things can change at the drop of the hat. Be the guy that looks for the opportunity be like, I love talking to people. So therefore I'm going to do that today. And you lead to one conversation with someone and he's like, you know what? I actually have something for you that I think you'll like. And it's like, I mean, it's how me and you got hooked yeah, up, exactly. right? Like, like speaking with people they're like, I think you guys would connect. And it's like, that's how, that's how opportunity happens. And it's like, pick up the phone and say, man, Scott was a cool guy. Like he's, you know, and it's, I think you got to be the guy that looks for opportunity in anything and everything. And I think that's when you find joy and happiness is like, nothing's a life sentence. Like find those things that are bringing you joy and, and lean into them. Yeah. I, I, man, I love that message. I think across the board from business to relationships to, you know, being a parent to, um, you know, being a, being a leader and, and, or just being the newbie you know, that that's there, like, uh, not being scared, not being afraid, being okay with being uncomfortable and then leaning into the comfortable stuff to find some balance. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's solid advice. Dude, this has been a great conversation. I mean, I, I, I gained a lot of, uh, new knowledge about sort of the, the, the industry in and of itself. Like I said, I know a lot of guys that are boots on the ground that work specifically with clients, either with very small companies or even, even big ones. And, uh, you, you, you provided some really cool insight today. I think for me is very helpful and I hope it is for other people and the message. I love the messaging just with like, Hey, just, you know, like EP is cool. Right. And there are people that need this, the service, right. There are people that really do need this service. So I, I just want to make this point. You know, I've talked to a lot of people and I've gotten comments that I thought were weird kind of in the past with people that have a lot of resentment for those that employ quote unquote, executive protection. And because they think like, this is some like rich, you know, uber wealthy person that, um, you know, that is afforded these services uh, because they think they're more important than somebody else or, and, and they get special privileges and whatnot. And while in some level, some of that, there's some truth to all of it, right? Like right. that is not, uh, that is, those are not all the people that are, that are, that are using these services. And I think it's important to remember that there are people that need this. They are not equipped they're not equipped physically. They're not equipped with the soft skills, with the hard skills, with the software, any of that to take as good a care of themselves as in their families, as they, in their property and their privacy, as they need to given whatever situation they happen to be in, in life, which has created a massive opportunity from a, from a, like a career perspective or for those people that like to help people. Um, and, uh, and, as we stay, started the show off, man, this is one of the fastest growing uh, industries in the world right now. And, and uh, hopefully more people like you, Blake, find their way into it and, uh, and continue to spread the good word and help, help other people out. I appreciate awesome. you coming down, man. Yeah, I really appreciate being here. It was awesome. Yeah, man. I, I'm uh, really excited to see kind of where the, where your career path continues to take you because you're a young guy. And I'm sure after talking to you, there's, there's a lot of things you want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as, uh, CR 24 has you, I hope they, they take advantage of uh, your passion and your energy and, and, and your skill set, man. But I'm also, I'm also thoroughly convinced whatever you want to do, you're going to be uber, uber successful at it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for having me on Th today. Thanks for your time, man. I, lo I love what you're doing, man. It's awesome. Ah, thanks, so man. Cool. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Thank Th you. Thanks, bud. Awesome. Maybe we can do this again sometime. We'll go yeah. out and get out and train. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks. Guys.